I'm Jennifer Wycorn and I'm delighted to be talking to you today on behalf of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust about performing Shakespeare's music. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about Shakespeare's song lyrics, about the context of music in the plays, about composing for those plays and Shakespeare's music in performance with a few musical examples. Now, I'm obviously coming to you from my living room here uh, which isn't a particularly theatrical space I do seem to have quite a lot of silly hats lying around, but they won't be making an appearance. Uh, nevertheless, I will try and perform some bits of the music for you. So first, a little bit about me. I'm a theatre music researcher. I'm just finishing off my PhD at the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon, and I'm looking at the music of the King's Men, Shakespeare's theatre company, when they move into an indoor theatre around 1608-1609 onwards. I'm also a musician, I'm a theatre composer and a music director. I'm sometimes an actor as well. I've worked on about 30 different productions and about 20 of those have been Shakespeare productions. Today I'm just going to focus on one play for you. There's obviously tons of music in Shakespeare and I have written quite a lot that I'd like to share with you, but we could be here all day, so I'm just going to do the one play. And it's Shakespeare's most musical play. I'll let you try and guess what it is. It's not As You Like It or Twelfth Night, although they do come quite close. It's actually The Tempest, so today we're going to be looking at music in The Tempest. I'm going to be talking briefly about an overview of the play, then about some of the most striking songs within that play. I'm then going to look at some of the other types of music that can be used for The Tempest and kind of in the theatre more generally and I'm going to finish off talking more broadly about songs inspired by Shakespeare's words. So first of all, what happens in The Tempest? You may know this quite well already but let's just quickly run over the plot. I am really sorry that there are spoilers in this if you haven't read or seen the play but here we go. So The Tempest is set on a magical island Prospero, the Duke of Milan, has been banished there and has become a powerful magician. The island is inhabited by a magical spirit called Ariel, who is bound as Prospero's servant and kind of oversees a whole host of lesser spirits. Now, Ariel is by far the most musical character in the play. He has a number of songs and he uses music to perform magic especially when he's leading various people around the island and making them feel particular emotions. So music in The Tempest isn't just there to entertain the audience or for character exposition, although it does do both of these things, hopefully, and they are both really important aspects of theatrical performance. But by tying the music into Ariel's magic, Shakespeare makes music a key part of the plot developments. It also means that the island exists in a very musical world of its own and this is open to all kinds of different theatrical interpretation. It means that the music can be used to shape the whole landscape of the play and this is really exciting in modern performance when we have all kinds of musical resources at our disposal. So The Tempest has been described as Shakespeare's attempt at writing a musical. But why did he do this and why did he do it at this particular time? Well, this is a key part of my research and I'll quickly run over some points on this. So around this, a couple of years before this point, uh, the King's Men have moved into the indoors Blackfriars Theatre, which means they've now got access to a really contained acoustic space. They've got a much more sophisticated musician's gallery above the stage for their musicians to sit in and play. And they've also got a house band. The Blackfriars musicians are really quite well known as being fantastic performers, so they can play all kinds of things for the plays. The Kingsmen also have access to court composers, including people like Robert Johnson, who they can ask to write some really interesting music. They've also got access to the latest fashions at court, so they can work in some really sophisticated and new musical styles. So, at the point where The Tempest is written, the company have been settled into this space for about two years or so, two, three years. So it's time to show off. So I think these are some of Shakespeare's kind of practical motivations for including all this music, as well as the artistic interest and in all these different possibilities. So what did this original music for this space sound like? Well, we actually have two surviving songs written by the composer Robert Johnson and we're pretty sure that they were written for some of the original performances. 
Both songs are sung by Ariel. There's Where the Bee Sucks, There Suck I, when he's talking about himself and what he gets up to. And there's Full Fathom Five, where Ariel is leading Prince Ferdinand around the island to prosper out. We're going to be looking at both of these songs in a bit more detail later on. So for now I'm just going to play you Full Fathom Five and just have a little listen to the lyrics and the tone and see what you think. Full fathom five, thy father lies, of his bones are corals made, those uppers that were his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but to suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. See nymphs early ring his knell. Hark, now I hear them. Hark, now I hear them. Ding dong bell. Ding dong, ding dong bell. Ding dong, ding dong bell. Ding dong, ding dong bell. So the reason these songs survive to the present day is because various people in the 17th century decided to write them down. We have private manuscript collections of music with these songs in, and there are also printed music books which were circulating during the 17th century. Some of them are by the composer Robert Johnson's colleagues and friends, and we even have musical pupils and teachers who have written down the music to try and learn it. But there's a key element of the relationship between Shakespeare's words and music, which means that we see them very differently today. And that's the way that they kind of survive separately from each other. So Shakespeare's music and the songs aren't generally kept with the play texts. And that's partly because of the people who engage with them. It's a smaller group of people who feel able to write, read and perform the music. And so that smaller group of people have a different motivation when it comes to music and words. This means that Shakespeare's words and play texts are treated quite differently. So, for example, in a modern production, text is usually a little bit cut down, but it's almost always the starting point. You work with what Shakespeare gave you, you pick up the script and you use that. But very few composers, when they're working on Shakespeare, use the original music as a starting point, even though it was written with Shakespeare's approval. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. Times change and musical styles and expressions change. I certainly don't always use the surviving songs as a starting point myself. And when you're creating a kind of island landscape for The Tempest, using music is a great opportunity for a director and a composer to make it their own. And changing the music isn't a new thing at all. Various famous versions of these songs survive elsewhere. So if you Google where the bee sucks there suck I, you'll generally get Thomas Arne's version of The Tempest from 1746, where he writes his own new version. And adaptations of the songs is done even earlier than that. In the mid 1600s, so 1650s, John Wilson, who's another Kingsman composer who worked with Robert Johnson, decided to print quite a lot of the King's Man music. And he included Johnson's original music for The Tempest in his printed book. But instead of just including Ariel's songs, his solo songs, he decides to add two extra singers in. So he adds his own harmonies to the songs and adds more complex layers. So here's what that song sounds like when it's been adapted by somebody else a few decades later. Full fathom five, thy father lies, of his bones are corals made, those are pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but to suffer a sea change into something rich and strange.
So let's have a think about how we might approach a modern production of The Tempest and how we'd go about composing music for it. We've got the original music, which we can use as a starting point, or not. We've got the play context, we've got Shakespeare's words, and we've usually also got the director's concept of what the magical musical island is going to be like. Now I'm going to be sharing some music I wrote for a production of The Tempest which was performed at the Shakespeare Institute in 2016 and it was directed by Beck Martin Williams. I'm going to talk about some of the decisions behind writing the music and how we performed it. So I wrote eight songs, six of them were using Shakespeare's lyrics and two of them were using my lyrics as well as my music. I arranged one modern song we put in there. I wrote one piece of dance music and several bits of other instrumental music and I also played Ariel. Now I picked this production and its music for this video as the concept was quite stripped back. The focus was on ensemble work, the cast was on stage all the time, there was a minimal set and the space was filled with performers and voices. There was lots of unaccompanied song and lots of vocal harmonies. Ariel was the musical focus, but the whole cast sang some numbers as though the island was singing. This isle is full of noises. And two other spirits joined Ariel in some three-part harmonies for some extra power and nuance at various points in the play. They were played by Elizabeth Luterman and Lexi Way. We did have some instruments, mainly violin and harp, so I will mention some of the effects of that instrumental music, but it was mostly voice. And hopefully it's a good one to share with you as you can hear clear choices in the melody and harmony lines that I wrote. It also shows that you don't need a whole band or even necessarily to be able to play a musical instrument in order to respond to Shakespeare musically. And hopefully I'm going to give you some insight into approaching Shakespeare's music practically. A few different ways to explore the many things you can do with it. It'll be something to think about maybe the next time you watch a play or it might even inspire you to have a go at it yourself. I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail about some of the thoughts I had when writing this music and you'll begin to notice a pattern. It's a kind of musical toolkit for creating certain effects and once you know the shorthands it's a lot easier to notice those effects being used in a show or even to try them out for yourself. So we're composing some music and Almost before we start deciding what the musicians and singers are going to be playing and singing, we've also got to think about where they're going to be in the theatre. It'll affect the way your audience experiences the music. Are your singers or musicians all together in the same place? Can they see each other while they're performing? Do they know when to come in or when to stop? Can the audience see them? And does Shakespeare give us any advice about this? Well, most plays from Shakespeare's time tend to have musicians on the main stage or up in the gallery behind the main stage. The focus was usually on one location at a time. So if somebody was singing a solo, they might have accompaniment with them on stage or somebody performing in the gallery. Usually all the musicians were together up there. But Shakespeare likes to experiment and not just in The Tempest. This does also happen elsewhere as well. So in Antony and Cleopatra, he includes a stage direction which says, the music of the oboes under the stage. It's meant to sound ominous and infernal. It's not a good sign. But practically, what does this mean? Do we have lots of oboists stood under the stage waiting to know when to come in? What do the audience think if this has never really happened before? What's that sound and where's it coming from? It's logistically quite tricky. And in The Tempest, I think Shakespeare goes even further. In the incredibly long Act 1, Scene 2, the Prince Ferdinand has been washed up on the island after the storm and he's all alone. Suddenly, he hears magical music. Ariel begins to lead him across the island to Prospero with an inviting song called Come Unto These Yellow Sands. And Ferdinand describes the song like this. Where should this music be? In the air or the earth? It sounds no more. This music crept by me upon the waters, allaying both their fury and my passion with its sweet air. Thence I have followed it, or it hath drawn me, rather. But tis gone. No, it begins again. So 
Ferdinand is pretty confused at this point, as most of us would be on a magical singing island after a shipwreck. But in his first line of the play, he's not asking what the music is, but where it is. And he can't tell if it's above or below him. So what if it's everywhere? And it's not just aerial singing, it's other spirits too. Now the song lyrics for this are quite short, but that doesn't mean the music has to be. Echoes can mean lots of different repetition. A key feature of music from this period is repeating key phrases or refrains, so we can definitely be flexible with using lines more than once, and maybe from different parts of the theatre. Something else to bear in mind, Shakespeare's songs aren't necessarily as short as they look if the lyrics are repeated many times. Now the last line of the song says that sweet sprites bear the burden, and a burden is another word for a chorus. Shakespeare uses this in As You Like It as well. So Ariel is indicating that his group of spirits can keep singing a refrain or they can bear the burden. Ferdinand also says that the song allays his passion and the fury of the waves with its sweet air. So this tells us something about the song's tone. It's calmed passion and it's kind of calmed the waters as well. So before we've even started writing any music, there's a lot of information to play with. We've got multiple singers, we've got echoes and repetitions, we've got all of the space in the theatre potentially being used uh, as a kind of surround sound and we've got a sweet air. So what did I do? I decided to keep the music itself quite simple. I used one melody line, but I had the spirits repeat it in a round from above and below. And the tune is bright and quite playful as the words are encouraging Ferdinand to follow the music. But there's the occasional slight edge because things take a slightly darker turn after this song. So I repeat the last line of the song three times, bear the burden. And on the last time, the harmonies are a bit crunchier. It's sort of keeping that unease in there. We're not used to hearing clustered notes in a vocal harmony. It's meant to be quite disconcerting. So the island's producing this weird resonating sound. Have a listen and see whether you can hear those ideas in the song. Come unto these yellow sands, come unto these yellow sands, come unto these yellow sands, and then take hands. Hands. And then take hands. Hands. And then take hands. Hands. So while we're listening to Come Unto These Yellow Sands within the play, Ferdinand is being drawn across the island by the song and it's calming both his passion and the waves. Ferdinand then describes what he's just heard before the music starts again, but this time it's quite different. This is where Full Fathom Five comes in and it's possibly the best known of Shakespeare's songs in The Tempest. It's got some really beautiful lyrics, but they're quite haunting ones. Now, the motive behind this song is for Ariel to convince Ferdinand that his father, the king, has died in the storm and that he's been magically transformed underwater. The song could have different end results, which the director and the actors might want to experiment with as well as the composer. So one possibility is that it's to scare Ferdinand into respecting the island and its magic. 
The second is that it might be to disorientate him further, so when Prospero appears, he won't be on the attack. And thirdly, it might be to make Ferdinand feel grief and sadness for his father, to convince him that he is really dead. So when he meets Prospero and his daughter Miranda, they will have Ferdinand's full attention. It could also be a mix of these three, fear, confusion and grief. So what pointers do we have in the text about the song? Well, Ferdinand helpfully describes this one too. He says, The ditty does remember my drowned father. This is no mortal business, nor no sound that the earth owes. I hear it now above me. So we've got a few more hints here. We've got unearthly music, which doesn't sound like anything human. And it's specifically above Ferdinand this time. So that suggests maybe a more focused point. He's worked out where the song's coming from. Maybe that means that Ariel has a more specific melody line here. He's also mentioned his drowned father, so that suggests that the song's been quite effective in convincing him that he's died. And the song lyrics refer to a bell ringing. So it's a magical death knell in honour of his father. So again, more clues in the words. So we have a location on stage, we have a feel to the music, and we have some pointers to include bell sounds. Shakespeare's always quite good at embedding pointers for the action and characters within the text, and so this is also true for the music. In the original music that Robert Johnson wrote, which we heard earlier, he included onomatopoeic bell sounds at the end of the song, picking up on this cue. So the ding, dong, ding, dong, bell. Obviously it sounds a bit like a bell. So the, the sound can be created by spirits singing rather than by using actual bells. For my version of this song, I decided I wanted the whole cast singing. It was about 15 people, so it felt as though the whole island was kind of threatening Ferdinand. They were arranged around the prince, and as Ariel, I was balanced on top of a ladder upstage, so I was above him, and I was singing the main part. Um, and we went with the motives of kind of fear and disorientation. Later in the play, Ariel appears as a big winged harpy to terrify the duke who usurped Prospero. And we thought it would be interesting to introduce this slightly malevolent magical power here as well. We don't know what Prospero is going to do with Ferdinand in the next scene, so it heightens the tension if it could be quite dangerous. So I put everything in a minor key to give it a bit of an edge, and I made Ariel's solo quite alarming and discordant. The main phrases of the song keep starting high and sliding down, ending on low notes, so it kind of mirrors Ferdinand's father sinking down. I also wanted a wall of sound with all these actors, uh, so the final ding-dongs, the bell noises in the text, are actually what begin my version of the song and carry on throughout as a kind of drone. There's another set of high, quite sinister bells which begin part way through the song when Ariel says that he hears them for the first time. And I've also got a basic chord being plucked throughout as another drone. I've done it here on the guitar. Sneakily, uh, this is also a practical consideration. It helps the singers to stay in tune and keep in time. So, we've got fear and disorientation, we've got death knells, we've got a startling solo, and we've got discordant harmonies positioned all over the stage. Here's a slightly underpowered version with just me. It's not quite 15 people, but you can imagine it surrounding this poor Prince Ferdinand. Five, four, 
So Full Fathom 5 and Come Unto These Yellow Sands do a fantastic job of really creating this magical atmosphere of the island and of moving the plot along. But Shakespeare gives these songs another function. They do a really good job of showing us Ferdinand's emotional state. He's only been on stage for the length of the two songs, he hasn't said that much really, but we know a lot more already about his characters and his feelings based on what he's heard and how he reacts to the music. He could be weeping, scared, defensive, or maybe fascinated by what he's hearing. There are various songs in Shakespeare's plays where a key character is listening to somebody making music and we're really invited to watch their reactions. We sometimes call these singers proxy singers, especially if they've been directed by other characters to sing on their behalf. Often the main characters on stage aren't musicians themselves. Gentlemen and ladies didn't play or sing in public in Shakespeare's time. It was considered a real social faux pas. So if a noble character comes on stage singing, they're either being deliberately rude, they're drunk, like Sir Toby Belch in Twelfth Night, or they've maybe gone mad. This is why mad characters often sing, like Ophelia in Hamlet. It's shorthand for the audience that they no longer understand the social norms. If a gentleman is asked to sing, they have to apologise profusely and acknowledge that they technically shouldn't be doing it, like Amiens in As You Like It and Balthazar in Much Ado About Nothing. Musical characters are often professionals, like Autolycus, the ballad seller in The Winter's Tale, or jesters like Feste in Twelfth Night. So sometimes when they're directed to sing, it could be in pursuit of a lover. So Cloten in The Two Gentlemen of Verona hires a singing boy to woo Sylvia by singing her a love song. Twelfth Night has some really good examples. Orsino actively requests his own mood music throughout the play. If music be the food of love, play on. And that means that while the song is one of the focuses on stage, there's usually something else, maybe unspoken, happening at the same time. The other characters aren't just frozen. Often, the singer isn't the focus at all. It's something we always have to bear in mind when writing and performing theatre music. Even if you have a big solo song, 90% of the time the focus is not just going to be on you. Very occasionally, a key character is musical and does have a song that's directly about their character, but it is quite rare. There is a really interesting example of this in The Tempest, and the song is, surprise surprise, sung by Ariel towards the end of the play. Ariel isn't constrained by social norms, he's a magical spirit. And the song is Where the Bee Sucks, There Suck I, and Ariel sings it as Prospero has promised to free him immediately after the spirit performs his last command. It's kind of like a musical monologue. There's a lot of scope within different productions to play this song in a variety of ways, depending on Ariel's relationship with Prospero. Is Ariel taunting Prospero for deliberately revoking his own magical powers? Is he nervous about being let loose and reluctant to leave Prospero? Is he just happy to be set free? There isn't necessarily one answer, and you can incorporate more than one into a single performance. The song gives you extra scope to really make the most of Ariel's moment, and the music can absolutely shape those moods. So what do we have to work with? These are the lyrics. They are in the present tense, blurring the lines between Ariel's current state and his imagined new state of freedom, which hasn't quite happened yet. They're focused on detailed snapshots of nature, of plants and animals, a bit like Mercutio's Queen Mab speech in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The bee, cowslips, owls, bats and blossoms are much smaller aspects of nature than the elemental forces of waves and weather which Ariel's been commanding at the beginning of the play. And the spirit describes interacting with nature more gently rather than controlling it, so there's a gentler tone than the earlier songs and appearances. There are no references to other spirits creating magical music, no sweet sprites bearing burdens or ringing bells, it's just Ariel. And it's still possible to include these other spirits here, they are commanded by Ariel and they may be set free too. But the lyrics suggest possibly some kind of solo, and this would also kind of resonate and maybe mirror Prospero's speeches as the play reaches its end and he prepares himself to be left alone. 
So that's what we've been given from the lyrics. Now we can just go for a straightforwardly major tune. Ariel might be blissfully happy so that he's free. Robert Johnson's original music for The Tempest sounds bouncy and happy to a modern audience. It's light and rhythmic, it's in beats of four, until the last line, merrily, merrily shall I live now under the blossom that hangs on the bough, which speeds up in beats of three as though Ariel can't wait to leave. So here's the original tune. Where the bee sucks, there suck I, in a cowslip spell I lie, there I couch when owls do cry, on the bird's back I do fly, after summer merrily. Merrily, merrily shall I live now, under the blossom that hangs on the bough. Merrily, merrily shall I live now, under the blossom that hangs on the bough. So we could very plausibly go with this happier approach. Ariel's really glad to be free and leaves light-heartedly. But it's also possible to add some extra nuance in if it suits the production and the characterization of Ariel. Now it would be quite strange if we put the whole thing in a minor key and did a sort of full-on dirge, but it is possible to make a major piece of music sound a bit sad and I decided to mix in some of both. So my version is unaccompanied, it's just Ariel singing, as though it's an internal monologue. There are some little onomatopoeic moments in there, you might be able to hear the owls cry, and the major lines tend to end on a minor note. Now this is a really common trick for flipping the mood slightly, especially at the end of a song, if the whole song's been happy and then at the end it just slightly turns, it can really shift the feeling leading into the next part of the scene. My version is generally not particularly rhythmic, there are gaps between the lines as though Ariel's taking a moment to appreciate each thought, and to appreciate his last moments on stage. The merrily merrily section is joyful and rhythmic, it's actually quite hard not to make that joyful and rhythmic, but the repetition of that line is more subdued, as if Ariel's only just realised that maybe freedom is a bit daunting after all. I recorded a version of myself singing this just outside Holy Trinity Church where Shakespeare's buried at about six in the morning when no one was around the other day. Here it is. Where the bee sucks, there suck I in a cowslip spell, I lie. And there I couch when owls do cry. On the bat's back, I do fly. After summer, Mary Lee, Mary Lee, Mary Lee, shall I live now under the blossom that hangs on the bough? Under the blossom that hangs on the so either of these approaches to where the bee sucks could work equally well in a performance. You could even change up the feel of the moment more by adding more voices, or maybe some instruments. And that brings me on to talking a little bit about instrumental music in the theatre, and just how much it can change the feel of a production. I focused on the song so far because Shakespeare doesn't tend to give us as much detail about instrumental music. Very little instrumental theatre music from the period actually survives, and often there's just a brief stage direction for music to indicate that something should be performed, but we don't know exactly what it was. There are various reasons for this, but a key one is that as Shakespeare didn't write the sheet music himself, just the words, it wasn't kept with the text. If the musicians hung on to it, it's not preserved for the rest of the play. Or maybe the musicians at the time knew what was needed without being told. 
so it didn't need to be written down. It's also worth mentioning here that one of the most fundamental elements of modern theatre and film music is generally not found in Shakespeare's plays, and that's underscoring or atmospheric background music. You can hear some underscoring right now. This is a wordless version of the song we had earlier, Come Into These Yellow Sands, with Elizabeth Litterman playing the harp and myself on the vocals. Nowadays, we almost take it as a given that there will be underscoring, particularly in films, and usually in theatre too. Sometimes the mark of a skillful theatre composer or a sound designer is to provide underscoring that shapes the atmosphere on stage without the audience even realising it. In Shakespeare's theatres, music carried such weight in performance that it was generally assumed that if you could hear it during a performance, it was an integral part of the world of the play. So it was intended to have a direct effect on the characters rather than just on the audience. And we tend to refer to this as diegetic music. Now Shakespeare uses diegetic music in various ways. Instrumental music in Pericles and the Winter's Tale induce enchanted sleep and bring statues to life. And those oboes under the stage in Antony and Cleopatra signify something ominous is happening. The oboes come back in Macbeth as well. But these are more explicit markers than we're maybe used to from more modern plays. There was some instrumental music which wasn't a direct part of the play's fabric in the theatres during Shakespeare's time. Music was performed during the act breaks in the indoor theatres while the candle wicks were trimmed. We do have evidence of some playwrights from the period indicating that particular types of music should be used for these breaks to set the mood. This kind of functions like modern transition music, which can be used to cover a scene change or to mark a change in place or time on stage. There doesn't really seem to be any evidence that Shakespeare shaped his act break music, though it's possible that the music for the songs in The Tempest were recycled to produce a consistent musical theme to keep the audience on Prospero's magical island during these short breaks. And this recycling approach for underscoring is actually quite common for modern theatre music. It sounds lazy, but it's much more effective for shaping the world of a play. If an audience has heard a song which links a character to a particular melody or instrument, and they hear that melody or instrument later in the show, the link will be made again, even if it's possibly subconscious. Multiple themes can be used throughout a play to signify different characters, locations or emotional states. Melodies can be changed to suggest some kind of development. A happy tune can be made sad later on or a fast tune made slow. A melody can be cut abruptly short to signify different moods or moments. This generally works if you introduce the initial melody early in the production, as coming back one or more times gives it more weight. It's why a lot of musicals have reprises and bring back reworkings of earlier songs. So here's some of my underscoring for The Tempest again. Now, it's not really providing thematic atmosphere to this talk, but in our production we used it when Ferdinand first sees Miranda, Prospero's daughter and his future bride, and we keep using it in those moments. Because the tune comes from Come Unto These Yellow Sands, when Ferdinand receives a pleasant introduction to the island, and because it includes lines about courtship, take hands, curtsy when you have, and kissed, I decided to use that theme to make it signify their relationship. Later in the play, when Prospero realises that by matching his daughter with Ferdinand he's left himself alone, I brought the tune back in, but I made it slower and emphasised the uneasy final notes for some more poignancy. For modern theatrical productions, whether they're Shakespearean or non-Shakespearean, underscoring and thematic music often makes up the majority of the music that goes into a play, and sometimes you don't even notice it's there. It's an interesting experiment when you're watching a film or a play to make yourself notice what the background music is doing at any given moment. So, I've left the most obvious instrumental music out so far, which is dance music. There is a dance in The Tempest, when Prospero creates a magical wedding for Miranda and Ferdinand, which is presided over by spirits in the form of goddesses, and Ariel, of course, is controlling everything. So here's the stage direction. 
enter certain reapers, properly habited. They join with the nymphs in a graceful dance, towards the end whereof Prospero starts suddenly and speaks, after which, to a strange, hollow and confused noise, they heavily vanish. This is quite a lot of detail for Shakespeare, especially that strange, hollow and confused noise. That's quite a rare sound effect direction. We've got a dance of shepherds, or reapers, and some nymphs, magically made to appear by the spirits, which is cut off abruptly. That's the context we've been given. Now, as Shakespeare's company were under King James I's patronage when they first performed The Tempest, they performed in court performances called masks around the same kind of time period, in which dances like this one would feature. And it seems likely that the king's men would use the opportunity to show off their court connections by incorporating some of these royally endorsed dances. And even maybe the same music and possibly the same costumes could feature at court and in their plays. For commercial theatre goers, even the slightly richer ones who could afford to go to the indoor theatres, it must have been quite special to get to watch a dance created for the king himself. There's even a piece of dance music called The Tempest in a music manuscript book of mask dances from this period, and it might have been used for the play, although we can't be certain. This dance in the play would have been a pretty special moment then. In a modern production as well, dances are pretty special, although this is usually because they tend to take an extra amount of coordinated effort and rehearsal to sort for the dancers, the choreographer, composer and musicians. That extra work needs to pay off. It means another layer of collaboration. In order to write the dance music, you need to decide with the choreographer how fast the music needs to be, what kind of rhythm they want. Do they want a waltz, a march, a jig, a reel, or something less conventional? Are you going to make your dancers dance in 5-4 time? You also have to decide how the piece begins and ends. Do you give the dancers a clear introduction and a clear place to stop? How long is the piece? And are there clear sections for different parts of the dance? For our production, I worked with choreographer Ainsley Brolly. We decided on a rustic, folky feel, in keeping with those shepherds, and we went with a jig, which is particularly bouncy. I wrote four sections of music, each repeated twice, so the structure was AA, BB, CC, DD. This is kind of the equivalent of a longer piece of traditional folk music. The jig starts in a minor sounding folky mode and moves into a major one by the third section as the married couple get more and more enthusiastic about the dance. In the fourth section, the music gets gradually faster and faster until the dancers collapsed in a heap on the floor. This is the point where Prospero suddenly realised uh, he needed to interrupt the festivities. So bearing all this in mind, have a listen to the dance melody. It's on just solo violin here and just see if you can imagine those dancers being worked into the performance. So as I've mentioned, the choice of instruments and the way that you arrange the music that's written for them can make a huge difference to a piece. 
I've played this on a solo violin here and in the show we had a harp as well, but you can add different instruments to create those different feelings. If, for example, you add just a guitar, maybe doing a comedy offbeat and some cross rhythms, it sounds like this. Instruments can also give you some quite specific cultural markers. So say if you wanted to signify a play is set in the medieval period, we can introduce some medieval instruments. So here we have a hurdy-gurdy and a rebec, which is kind of an early fiddle, playing along with that original violin track. even use completely different instruments, still keeping the same tune and make it feel like a different genre of music. You could have, say, a full punk rock set up with drum kits and electric guitar, it would give you a really different feel. Or by changing the accompanying chords a little bit, by swinging the rhythm and adding some little embellishments, you can create a really jazzy sounding track. I'm sorry I can't show you more combinations of instruments for this one, but it is amazing how different you can make the same simple melody sound on a different instrument. Again, this isn't necessarily what we might think of as Shakespeare's music, but it does become part of the world you create for a Shakespearean production. And different instrument combinations were definitely an option for Shakespeare while he was writing The Tempest. The Blackfriars Indoor Theatre came with its own celebrity house band, playing what's known as a broken consort. That's a mix of different stringed instruments, which would be plucked, strummed and or bowed, as well as some woodwind, flute and possibly some percussion. We might not have the surviving musical results written down, but Shakespeare certainly wrote a musical world within The Tempest knowing that he could use this range of instruments played by talented musicians. So, we've looked at shaping Shakespeare's songs and working with the clues he provides for instrumental music within The Tempest. I'm going to finish off by talking about a third type of Shakespearean music, which is music more broadly inspired by Shakespeare. There are hundreds of songs riffing on Shakespeare's themes, characters and words, performed inside and outside the theatre, from classical music by Vaughan Williams to songs by Taylor Swift. As with any creative medium, 
Shakespeare provides a lot of incredibly fertile food for the imagination. Sometimes music inspired by Shakespeare's plays can have very specific contextual links. So, for example, Edward Elgar wrote a symphonic study called Falstaff, which depicts Falstaff's whole character through Henry IV parts 1 and 2 and his death in Henry V. It was Elgar's favourite piece of his own that he wrote. It does make a lot more sense if you're familiar with Falstaff's character arc to begin with, though. Usually, music inspired by Shakespeare is created to be performed in its own right, without being in a theatrical context. I'm a member of a band called The Company of Players, which specialises in songs inspired by Shakespeare. It's been fantastic to see the range of different individual approaches that a group of songwriters can have to the different plays. And you can have a listen to these on The Company of Players album, Shakespeare Songs, should be available through Bandcamp. For my Tempest music, I wrote two songs inspired by Shakespeare to be performed in the production, which can also work independently of the production on their own. Both songs came right at the start of the play and helped to establish the setting before the dialogue of the first scene began. This was partly because we wanted to make some more of the storm scene that happens at the very beginning of the play. You're suddenly thrown on board a ship, fighting not to sink, and it's only later that you learn it's a magical storm created by Ariel and Prospero. We also don't get to see very much of the crew. You see them at the start and then at the end when they turn up very confused that they've survived. Uh, and we wanted to make more of this group of characters who only appear briefly but have a pretty wild time of it. So in our version, I wrote a sea shanty for the sailors to sing at the start in two parts. So one part before the storm when they're working and then one just as the storm's about to hit. And I used phrases from Shakespeare's text in that storm scene, including Make yourself ready, we'll die a dry death, blow till thou burst thy wind, and we split or we fall apart. <laughs> in the first section, the sailors are hard at work hauling on ropes. Make yourself ready means stay alert and keep the ship in order. By the second part, as all the sailors look up at a huge wave that's just about to engulf them, Make yourself ready now means ready yourself for death, prepare yourself. It turned into the calm before the storm. Hopefully you can hear some of the differences that we've looked at in the previous songs used here for the two different parts of make yourself ready. There's the musical speed, there's the tone, and there's the rhythm. It's the same tune for both parts, but I've kind of inverted it to have those two different feelings. A ship she is for Naples bound Make yourself ready Now keep her trim or we run aground And we split, boys we split If any man aboard has sinned Make yourself ready Those roarers blow till they burst their wind And we split, boys we split But we'll die a dry death yet no doubt yourself ready just keep every drop of water out or we split boys we split keep every drop of water out or we split boys we split keep every drop of water out or we split boys we split Say your prayers, my boys, we're done Make yourself ready For all the fiends of hell have come And we split, boys, we split For all the fiends of hell have come And we split, boys, we split For all the fiends of hell we split, boys, we split. 
With songs like Make Yourself Ready, the power in performance really comes from having a collective group of characters on stage to sing it. You get more of a sense of a shared emotional state and that collaborative performance, a bit like the Isle of Spirits for Full Fathom Five. I'd like to finish on a final song I wrote for the very opening of the play, originally sung by Ariel and his two accompanying spirits. Here it's also a group number. Within the play, the song introduced the audience to the rich, strange, magical world of the Tempest, signified by Ariel's music. I've reworked some of the lyrics since the production so it works as a standalone song, inviting you to a musical island. The phrases rise and fall like waves, and as more voices are added and the harmonies build up, the invitation becomes stronger. So I asked around to see if anybody I've worked with in the Shakespeare world would like to join me in singing on this, and I'd be very lucky to have people respond with their recordings of the harmonies from their various lockdown locations. I'll play it for you in just a minute. As we've seen, music in Shakespeare's plays, and particularly in The Tempest, becomes a multi-layered endeavour. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to combine the rich toolkit of musical signifiers used in theatre music more generally with Shakespeare's own lyrics, musical directions and experimentation. One of the best things about working on theatre music for me is that it's always a collaborative experience. All kinds of people come together to build a performance and the musical world within it. Playwrights, actors, directors, musicians, dancers, choreographers, composers, musical directors and, of course, the audience. Shakespeare certainly didn't write in a vacuum. He was a theatrical collaborator and he wrote for and with his musical colleagues. So. I'll play you my last song, which is definitely a collaborative effort. I really hope you've enjoyed hearing a few insights into Shakespeare's music, into composing for the theatre, and the Tempest's world of musical magic. And who knows, you might even want to create a musical island of your own. There is a place out on the horizon Sits in the corner of your eye A kind of haze Shivering uncertain Just where the salt sea Meets the sky Oh, won't you come just a little closer You'll reach the place If you follow me Through curling clouds Through the restless ocean You'll reach the place Beyond the sea
sits in the corner of your eye. A kind of haze, shivering, uncertain, just where the salt sea meets the sky.